Okay, so we're talking about Mildred, and we're talking about uh, the supernatural experiences that she's operated in. Is there anything else you want to add? Uh, any examples or uh, describing the amount of revelation that she's operated in, or are you happy with that? You want to move on? Well, I would like to say this, that when my sister was healed, uh, here she was rigid, you know, grew rigid in my dad's arms, and, and uh, death, no doubt, had, uh, had set in. Uh, when about 30 minutes later, when my mother and my grandmother really touched the Lord in and, and this ardent uh, vigil uh, prayer, you know, with, with, with this tenacity of holding on, holding on to the Lord to bring my sister back, uh, the power of God struck her and she um, uh, leaped from my, my father's arms from his lap and danced at that early age, danced in the spirit and, and was speaking in a, in a beautiful language, just glorifying God with her little hands up in the air all over the, uh, all over the room. So it was just a, a real wonderful thing that happened there. Wow, that's powerful. So uh, after this visitation, I've heard you discuss the fact that uh, from that time on, that was kind of a line of demarcation in your life, that uh, there was times that uh, you wanted to be normal again because you began to see, you know, as we've heard uh, uh, John Paul tell these stories, we've heard others, Bob Jones, they could see even in their childhood days, and it was actually not an exciting thing, it was a disturbing thing, is what I heard from the testimonies of others. That, and you began to have this operation of the Spirit, and you felt, uh, you resented it, and... Uh, what kind of abnormal things like school? What kind of relationship did this have on your school? What kind on your academics? Did other children ostracize you? I mean, like let's describe, you know, ages eight to fifteen. Well, I wasn't a good communicator and, and didn't uh, fit in in school. After I had the experience at age nine. And uh, I, I literally fell in love with, with the Lord. Now, the age nine, the you mean baptized in the Holy Spirit? Right. Okay, you were, the vision was in age eight, and then the, you were filled with the Spirit in age nine. Right. I, I was uh, converted. I was saved at age eight, and between the age eight and nine, I had the visitation. But anyway, after that, I wasn't any good for anything. But I really fell in love with the name of Jesus. I fell in love with the Lord. I used to go out and, and uh, the wee hours of the night's morning, I'd slip out of bed and go out to a field, a, a, uh, you know, a nearby farm, and just uh, talk to the Lord. The old cotton patch. Yeah, or cornfield, whatever, uh, and just, uh, uh, you know, find uh, the presence of the Lord there. It was, it was a wonderful thing, but I would beg the Lord not to speak to me, you know. I would say, Lord, if you love me, please don't, uh, don't ever speak to me again unless I'm in public. And, you know, that sort of thing, because it was, you know, so it was frightening. a frightening experience, yes. I mean, you really cried out like that to the Lord. Right. Said, speak to me only in, in, when other people are around, but don't get me right. alone, alone at night, late, when it's dark. But that's right, true. But I had no interest in academic things like school or even, even sports. I wasn't, uh, uh, you know, too inter interested in that. So the, the first time around after the visitation of the Lord and the Spirit-filled uh, life began. A teacher, I never forget, her name was Mrs. Strange, and so uh, she was strange, but in a wonderful way. And uh, she Mrs. Was, strange. Yes. She was a young, a young lady with white hair. It's an amazing thing. Uh, she was probably in her late 30s, but very young, and she had snow white hair. Uh, but she was a very wonderful person, and she just fell in love with uh, Jesus in me. And she made me the, the uh, class uh, chaplain and would let me read my little New Testament, read a chapter out of the Bible every day, sometimes two if I could hold up. <laughs> so anyway, it was just an amazing thing. And uh, she gave me passing grades two years in a row, and I, I didn't earn them. I don't know. It was kind of supernatural. And the Lord would draw you aside. I've heard you give this testimony. The Lord would draw you aside. You'd spend hours in the Word, and sometimes you didn't even understand some of it, but you just had this desire to read it anyway. And He would be actually depositing it into your spirit, even though you didn't fully comprehend, you know, some of the things in Romans and Hebrews. But the Lord would draw him aside, and He had this insatiable hunger for the Word, though He couldn't pick up all of its meaning. But the Lord uh, just bypassed that and had Him do it anyway. 
Well, your childhood uh, friends, they called you droopy eyes. Give it a little bit on that. Well, I think it's because I was usually, uh, my eyes were downcast on reading the word. And uh, I believe that teacher really felt uh, sympathetic and a love for him because she did give me passing grades. And uh, uh, that's the closest I ever came to being the teacher's pet. But uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful lady. I appreciate her. So uh, you were ostracized by other children. They didn't understand the way you were operating in the spirit and, and why you were always walking. You, you mentioned that several times. You'd look at the ground and you're always praying all the time and you're just captured by the Lord. It seems so strange at eight and nine, but uh, you know, uh, uh, I believe we're going to see that a lot with uh, eight and nine-year-olds in the days to come and even younger than that. And uh, what kind of relationship did the children in the neighborhood have with you, uh, you know, with this kind of behavior? Well, I was a little strange uh, to them, you know, because I'd, I would have spurts of uh, revelatory stuff even at that young age. And uh, I was just a little weird and a little strange, and they didn't uh, want to be around anyone different. But uh, So it was all lonely even back at age 8 and 9? lonely, right. Mm -hmm. And the loneliness, you, you, that's something that you've walked in mm -hmm. in different degrees since that visitation of the Lord. Right. It was later that I would uh, ask the Lord to make me normal like everybody else, and I resented being called. I don't understand why young people would be rebels and uh, and turn away and from godly parents and run away from home and all that. I never did do anything like that. I never was able to live a successful, sinful life, but I resented not being able to for some reason. I don't know why. I wanted to be just like everybody else, and I didn't want to feel abnormal I didn't want to feel weird. I just wanted to, I didn't want to see things. I, so actually I there was a painful element, you know, like we're hearing the glory, but there was a painful, lonely, even depressing element to some of the things that were happening in your life. Right. And I, I felt uh, odd and I felt different. And I wanted to f at least feel like I thought everybody else felt. And I wanted to do what everybody else was doing. And um, it just couldn't be. Let's, let's hear about the children's church experiences. You began a, uh, a children's church, sharing with the children in the neighborhood, those that had a heart for the Lord. You'd bring them and preach to them. Your sister played the piano. Let's, just anything right. we want to share about that. My sister was in new school, and she was very spiritual. In fact, she was probably the, the most godly young person I knew. She was six years my senior, but uh, she really loved the Lord. I remember her as probably one of the most spiritual young people in the church. And uh, so she would get her friends, which the older group, and uh, then I would get, uh, you know, some of the young people my age. Uh, they would uh, come and have uh, prayer meetings in our home, and so we'd sing. And uh, some wonderful experiences would happen. There was even the falling in the spirit uh, type thing going on then. I never will forget one young lady. She was. Uh, you know, the uh, beauty queen uh, of, of the whole town. Like and age she 11 or 12? Well, or... Yeah, but she was a beautiful blonde hair, natural blonde hair, you know, and she was a beautiful blonde girl, and she was so proud. And uh, so I remember praying for her one night, and she fell under the power, and her head landed in the cold bucket. It had one <laughs> It had one of these big mouths on it, you know, the spouting like you pour coal out of. And so her head landed in the coal bucket, and uh, the, uh, the handle fell down over under her chin. She looked like she had some kind of a helmet, a metal helmet on. And then she came out of that with uh, coal black hair and uh, a black face. So it was just a little more thing. humility. Yeah, so it really humbled her. And I, I really appreciated the Lord doing that because I didn't, I didn't like her too well. So you'd have the meetings at home and, and, and would and you... And I didn't push her either, but okay. the Lord, I, she was slaying in the spirit. I didn't have, I didn't help her. Okay, so uh, you first started in the home and would you actually do any preaching? Would you get a yes, chair? I was Long before that, they would stand me up on a big round uh, table and, uh, you know, the dining table, and I would preach standing on the table to the people gathered in the home. Okay, and so that happened for a few years, and then you moved out, and, and some of you got together and actually built a little uh, Yeah, right after edifice. that, uh, uh, 
my uh, best uh, boyhood friend. He was uh, uh, a little older and was very strong and, and uh, was quite gifted. And he helped me build uh, our little church. And we, we uh, I, I don't know where we got the lumber. We got a lot of scrap lumber. And I don't know where we got the, the roof for it. I got uh, in trouble over that. We had to have a lot. <laughs> Where'd you get it from? Well, I, I don't want to be good to say on this. Oh, I think it would. You think it would? Okay. <laughs> Do you know where we got the roof? No, no but I'm not going to know. Well, I thought I told you one time. But anyway, it's kind of a... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 let's think about it. How many of you know where we got the roof? Yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's not in keeping with the dignity of the ministry. But... Uh, we got, uh, oh, these boards were large fence boards. I remember that. They were fence boards, and we put them all together and, and uh, you know, framed a, a little building. And so there was a building out back. You see, in those days, we, like, you'd have a three-bedroom house and a path, not three bedrooms and three baths, but you'd have a path, and there would be what they called an, an outhouse, you know, out, an outbuilding. But we had a very nice one. It had a shingle roof on it. And it had? Uh, uh, yes, it had a shingle roof on it. So I got all of the, the boys out of my class to help me lift that roof off of that building. It was quite a chore. I mean, it took half a dozen of us to get that thing off of there. And we put it on my church for the opening service. That's right. And we whitewashed all the, the boards. I remember there was a, a little lady that I called my aunt. She gave me the money to buy some whitewash, and we mixed that up and painted the church. We have this beautiful uh, roof on it. For Dedication and, uh, Sunday. Yes. So, but I got a, I got a whipping. Uh, my dad uh, told me how much we needed that roof, uh, and so uh, it wasn't to be used for so, the church. So how many showed up on Dedication Sunday? About 16. So right. was that a full house? Oh, it, was a, it was a packed outhouse. I mean, it was a packed outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> it was a... <laughs> Honest, before the Lord, I didn't mean to say it that way. It was, it was a full house. <laughs> I remember Paul saying that uh, eventually the, the church grew to 23, and it kind of peaked oh, out at 23. And that uh, was the first mega church, first yeah. mega children's church. Uh, time for a split then. They had 23 uh, jammed into that room and uh, had glorious stories of revelation and healings and the Lord visiting and the power of the Lord hit the children. Well, we can't say all the power stuff and all that. We had a lot of power, but we didn't have speaking in tongues or anything like that. And I'd always wait till my grandmother went to bed before we started the service because I knew that she moved in great power and speaking in tongues. And so we didn't want her. I was still a Baptist, a spirit-filled Baptist, but I didn't want my grandmother involved. She'd because come she into was, the service, right? Yeah, and she would uh, stand outside and dance and shout and say, there's my, she called me Buzzy. That was my nickname. She'd say, there's my Buzzy and Jesus is blessing him. And she'd start dancing and scare me so the service would automatically be dismissed. And, and, uh, yeah. So when Grandma came, because you were her buzzy, you knew that she was so proud of you that you, and I was, was it because you were embarrassed or were you afraid well, of her? You, you know, we had a lot of uh, young people. A lot people, of Baptists there. Didn't understand. Well, we even had the, the son of the Presbyterian uh, pastor. So you had a lot of visitors there. Yeah, a lot of, and we, we didn't want to, you know, we wanted to make it palatable for him, so we, so we didn't want to. Uh, you know, get into that wild stuff. Anyway, my grandmother would always go to bed early. Hey, he didn't want to get into the wild stuff because yeah. of the visiting people from the Presbyterian Church. Okay, go ahead. I like this. Uh, so I've always been conservative. Uh, and never so you'd wait until she went to bed before you had the night Yeah, services. she went to bed with the chickens. and Well, we weren't that poor, but I mean, she went to bed early. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she went to bed early, and I'd wait until she was... Uh, uh, and bed or sleep, and then we'd start our service, but usually it would wake her up. Okay, uh, any uh, unusual uh, childhood visions? As we talked about this earlier, you said you had so many, you don't know which one to pull out, so I'd encourage you, maybe the, the first time you saw the Joel's Army vision as a young boy, what, nine or ten, you saw the angel, he drew the sword, as we've heard him say, he's seen this Joel's Army in training vision many, many times over the years, much like the stadium vision. 
And the first time was in those boiling days. Uh, can you remember the first time that you saw that vision when uh, the angel drew the sword? And it was truly awesome. My, it was like Jesus or the Holy Spirit. And standing there with sword drawn, and he was pointing to this sign uh, that was uh, brilliantly uh, lighted, and it, uh, it read Joel's army now in, in training. And I've seen that over and over. I would be pointing toward uh, a tabernacle type building and uh, what was going on in there was actually the training uh, for harvest and the training of Joel's army. I didn't know what all that meant then, but... Uh, but there's an I awesome vision right in front of you with the angel right. Lord. It was amber light. I never, you know, I never can get away from that because that was the same color light represented the glory of God and it would cover people. Or, I'd be over their heads when I called them out of the audience. I'd see that light, and this sign was uh, illumined with that light, or brilliantly. You uh, mentioned that you made sick calls, even as a little boy pastor at eight, nine, ten, eleven. You'd go pray for the sick one in the community. Well, yeah, at nine or ten, that was uh, when I was a member of the First Baptist Church in Garland, and it was the largest church, I guess, uh, in 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 Garland. It was. It's a very large church, thousands of dollars now. Texas, yeah. yeah, Garland is a suburb of Dallas. And so uh, the pastor, Dr. Parrish, he had an insatiable desire to know something about the supernatural. And he just loved my grandmother and my mother. And he showed me a lot of uh, special attention. And he was the first I ever heard say anything like uh, this anointing being passed down from one family member to the other. I remember just as clear, he said something like, uh, I know this sort of thing runs in families. Your grandmother had it, uh, your great-grandmother had it, your grandmother has it, your mother has it, and I know it's rubbed off on you. And I want to know what you see, and I want to know if you've ever had an experience like your grandmother, or like your great-grandmother. You know? And so uh, that's what got me in trouble. And because you would tell him the experiences. Yeah, because I didn't understand the experiences. It was like, I had revelation galore, but I didn't have any application, I didn't have any understanding, I didn't have any interpretation, uh, interpretation of it. Yeah, help me with that stuff. Okay, so uh, you would, uh, like, give an example. Uh, he would say, Paul, you're 9, 10, 8, 9, 10, 12, let's go pray for this someone, and what well, would happen? What, there were two pastors, but I started out with Dr. Parrish, and he would uh, uh, take me home after service sometimes, and... Uh, talk to my mother and my grandmother and try to get my grandmother to use the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, when she explained to him, you know, that wasn't the way uh, it, it worked, and uh, he'd be very sincere. And he said, well, could you just prophesy a little or, or even speak in tongues? Just do anything. Just, you know, give me a sample. And he was very sincere. He really was. But, of course, my grandmother was too. And uh, so he, he would keep after me then. But he was, he was very respectful. He treated me like an adult, and I was very uncomfortable because he would talk about doctrine, about close fellowship, you know, what the Baptists believed and all that. And uh, then that's when he would tell me, I know this has to rub off on you. Has the Lord ever show you anything? And then I would, I would tell him what I thought the Lord had shown me, and that would sometimes, uh, uh, I mean, not be a positive thing. So uh, he took you on sick calls, like give an example of, uh, like you'd see a vision ahead of time, describe the guy in the overalls, and they'd go there and it'd be just like a... Well, there were two of the pastors that did that, and uh, sometimes I get uh, one experience mixed with the other, but, but Dr. Parrish and then also Brother Peak, they would take me on like, sick calls. Like give a for instance, tell us. All right, for instance, uh, after the first little piece of discernment uh, panned out, uh, he would say, I'm taking you to, with me to pray for a sick lady. And has the Lord shown you anything about her? And I was visionary at, at that time, uh, off and on. And so I said, well, um, you know, matter of fact, he has. I said, this is a, an old lady, uh, 60 years old. I don't know where I ever got that idea that she was an old lady because uh, that wasn't old at all, you know. I said, she's an old lady. So you're 60 not now. Not now it is. I mean, not now. That's not old. But anyway, she's an old lady, 60 years old, and she's dying with cancer. And she has this, uh, it was like a pink, um, 
Uh, bathrobe? Bathrobe, like they buy a scissor robe, but uh, like they made bedspreads out of Chanel or whatever. I don't know what they call that stuff, I never could remember. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, so she's dressed that way, sitting up in this bed, it's a hospital bed and, a, and the den. And, and so I said that her brother is standing before the bed and uh, he has overalls on and a red and black uh, flannel shirt. Uh, I forget what we called it then, but it was like a hunting shirt. And uh, his name is Tom, and that's the way it's going to be when we walk in. And, and you had none of that information, obviously. Oh, no, I had no way of knowing any of that. So he said, oh, my, and that was very striking to him. And so he said, well, uh, is Mary, oh, I said, yeah, her name is Mary. I, mean, I remember the na her name is Mary. He said, well, is uh, Sister Mary going to be healed? And I said, well, I don't know. And I that's all I could see. I didn't know anything about it. So you'd walk in there and it'd be just like yeah. Mary would be there, and Joe would be there, whatever the Yeah, here was Tom staying in front of the bed, and it was uh, like a drama, and so he got very excited. So he would sit me down, and I don't, I don't remember whether Mary was healed or not, I really can't, because he was one of those that uh, always prayed, if it be thy will, and then he prayed for all the missionaries around the world. And, uh, so he never actually uh, commanded the sickness of no, the body. No, he never addressed that at all. But it's always to be that well. I remember he did that so many times. Uh, I don't remember hardly anybody getting healed. But uh, I remember thinking this. I said, "Oh Lord, if I ever grow up and if I ever get sick, uh, please don't let those, if it be Thy will, people, uh, come around me because I don't want anybody praying to me like that. Just just about everybody he prayed for died. <laughs> so uh, I don't I don't share any of that. Uh, responsibility because I didn't know how to pray for people uh, so so like how often did God speak to you in your boyhood years say age 10 to 18 or 8 to 18 did it happen did, you, did it happen every week did it sometimes happen every day did you have lots of dreams visions audible voices or a little bit of all of that well it was uh, the spontaneity of it you know it would just come when I wasn't expecting and it was more like knowing sometimes than anything else when I would be asked it'd be instantly uh, you know it in your spirit no, whatever, whatever I'd speak out, it would just be that would be like I was just speaking um, momentarily what I saw, and it would be that way, you know. And uh, just, I know that you've shared that through those years there were just, I, I don't know the regularity of it, but you would have the smattering of the visions and the visitations and the this and that and the other. And so, uh, but, but it'd be impossible probably for you to know the regularity because each season was different. Mm -hmm. That's how it is in the spirit. So I'm sure at some ages it was more than others. And so you experienced uh, rejection and fears. That's one comment you made that I wrote down here. You, you said the sentence, the cruel essence of loneliness. There were sometimes real fears and uh, times of rejection, times of loneliness in the middle of your, those teenage years and, and on into the 20s and 30s. Anything else you want to add about that? Or? Well, it, it wasn't total rejection. And of course, the older, uh, there's some older people in my life that treated me <coughs> beautifully, like Dr. Parrish. And, and Brother Peak and men like that, they treated me beautifully. In fact, uh, they did me a great disservice because um, the accuracy of the revelation also uh, permitted me to see things that were wrong in people's lives, and I didn't know how to handle that either. You'd tell the sins. Yeah, I would tell what the deacon was doing with the lady sitting with a funny hat on the front row, and uh, so I didn't know what he was doing. I just called it messing around, but they knew what that meant and I didn't. And uh, so it would be that way. And news got out that I was a, an awesome boy, wonder, a, a prophetic boy, and, and could see sins in people's lives. So the Baptist Church couldn't handle that, and, and I never did anything in the Baptist Church except maybe uh, in the union, uh, what do they call those little meetings, uh, would testify, but I never preached in the Baptist Church. And they didn't have any place for me. In fact, that's one of the things that the pastor would say. He said, now, someday when you grow up, said the Lord is going to use you if you keep yourself pure, there will be a place for you. And later life, and the Lord will use you with this gift. He said, we don't have any place for anything like this. Or what your grandmother has, or what your mother has, it's not accepted by the Baptists, but there will be a place. Anyway, this information leaked out. You know, I was able to see sins and all that. And the Pentecostal church in Dallas got a hold of it. And it was a memorial, Assembly of God. And so... Uh, so you were about 19 at the time? Well, I was 
quite young, I don't remember how old I was, but anyway, that was my first public meeting. The only other preaching I'd done was to the railroad spikes, you know, that I would uh, drive up in the ground, that I, these spikes I'd get from the railroad where they were working on the railroad and discard so, the old spikes. We, we've heard the story, but just say it again, he would go grab the railroad spikes and put them in his backyard and preach to them. And, of the Lord, you know, he longed for the day and would sometimes even weep and say, Lord, I so long for the day when I get to preach to real people who say real amens. Yeah, well, what I did, though, I, uh, it wasn't just bringing a spike home at a time. I'd go and get as many in a gunny sack uh, as I could carry, and uh, I would drive them up in the ground. And I knew at that time I was going to be an evangelist because I never had a crowd big enough to satisfy me. And I would go back and get more spikes, and I had... I had the biggest audience you ever saw in your life. It looked like soldiers' field. Like spikes. Everywhere. All these spikes going up there. And You'd get up and preach to them, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would read my little New Testament and uh, preach to them. And, but it would, uh, I was very serious when I would look up and uh, cry and say, Lord, someday this will be real and I'll be a real preacher. And, and They'll say real amen. Real amen. I want to get one or two quick things. I'm going to get right into the memorial assembly and then take off from the Tulsa and some of the things that happened there. Uh, the tires, I've heard you tell the story about the, uh, you gathered the tires ahead of time and how the Lord showed you to do that. Mm. Well, that was during the war, when the war hit, you know, on the rubber rationing, gasoline rationing. Uh, anybody remember that? You know, when uh, you had to have a sticker, and, uh, you know, you couldn't buy uh, tires or gas and uh, rubber was rationed. Well, uh, a few months before the, the war, my grandmother had seen all this and uh, I started gathering up. Your grandmother saw the war or the rationing or all of it? She saw all of this. So I started gathering up uh, tires that were discarded by uh, rich people. And, uh, you know, they'd get a new set of tires and they'd throw the old ones away. And uh, Americans, you know, were, were very extravagant at that time. Still are, but I mean, they really were then. And, and uh, so uh, we knew just, we knew everybody in town. Every service station owner loved my dad. and. Uh, had respect for my family, and they gave me all these tires that were turned in, you know, they didn't have any use for them, and occasionally they'd sell a used tire, but not often, and so they'd give me all these nice tires, still in good shape, and so I filled my father's barn with We had, I mean, like hundreds of them? Oh my, I can't remember, I don't know how I ever got them stacked up, but I had a, a big barn just stacked up to the ceiling. This was before the rationing me. started. Yes, that's right. And uh, so my dad helped me stack them up, and I, he went along with me. And, and what was he uh, thinking you were doing? Did you say, Dad, God told well, me? Well, he got aggravated a few times, you know. Did you get all these tires? Done with these, uh, uh, so this is ridiculous and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, we could have used the barn for something else because uh, my, my folks took care of horses and things like that. And so one of the barns was just filled with these tires. <laughs> but then when the, the war came and the rationing came, I was able to su help support our family. We made it through some very hard times. By selling the rubber selling, tires. Selling those tires for 50 cents a piece. It was just marvelous. I thought that was very interesting. Let's talk about dating. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, what, what kind of... How, how did, uh, <laughs> yes, how did you and Diane meet? Uh, how, not, uh, <laughs> not how did me, Diane meet? Uh, uh, I feel like, how many of you feel like this is a part of the interview? I mean, he's a, he was a boy, he was a young man, and what kind of experience? I mean, did you ever date uh, girls? Did you ever uh, notice they were cute? I mean, like, uh, or were you just all I, caught up in the Lord I, I all the time? In that one area, I was quite quite normal. I didn't know that I was going to be called to be a celibate. I um, I found, uh, uh, found very attractive, and I dated more than the average person, really. In fact, several famous men of God are married to my dates. Uh, I mean, they're married to the, the girls yeah, he, I dated. He's told us some of us uh, the uh, names of different preachers. He said, I dated her, and I dated her. And he said, well, yes. Paul, well, you little stinker. <laughs> you know, I never thought of him that way. And uh, he had a number of years where the Lord, uh, uh, I guess, blessed that or allowed that. And uh, Well, right. And I'm, I'm just quiet that, uh, uh, you know, that he let me... Uh, to live a, a godly life along the limits. I did date uh, quite, a, quite a bit. And so, uh, I just think that's great. So at age 21, you're in uh, uh, Santa Maria, California. You're uh, driving, the uh, uh, ministry's already started, I mean, in that kind of national way. It began when you're 18, 19, but we're gonna go back to that in a minute. You're 21, you're driving to Santa Maria, and I know you can't tell much about this, 
for the Lord visits you again. And then that's when it, the whole process of the call to celibacy begins. Can you share uh, or go as much detail as you can? Well, at that time I didn't know it was a call to celibacy, but the Lord uh, did come to me in a certain form. That's the reason I said he, he can appear anyway in any form that right. he chooses to. But he did uh, uh, appear to me in my car uh, driving through Santa Maria, California. I was driving from San Francisco to Los Angeles or to the mountains where I did most of my fasting and praying and hiding away. And so uh, by the time I got to Santa Maria, it was way after midnight, and uh, suddenly uh, uh, the angel of the Lord was sitting there with me, carrying on a conversation with me, telling me the Lord was very jealous of my companions. I mean, right there in the car, right this time you're, you're, you're looking, you're not hiding your face because you're driving. Right, it's a, it's a very strange thing that happened, and I was amazed. I couldn't imagine him being jealous of the kind of people I had around me because they were very godly people. And I was quite a recluse even at that time. I had, of course, dated a lot, but in meetings I would never date. I would never, I never dated a girl in a meeting and all anything like that. It would just be my free time when I was between meetings. I was very cautious about those things. But anyway, um, something wrong? No. Oh, good. All right. Uh, where were we? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, the, the angel Lord visits the you in the car. He said, says, I'm jealous of your companions. Yes. And uh, he uh, told me why uh, that uh, he was jealous that, uh, that he had a, a, you know, a special thing to do. But I didn't equate that uh, to celibacy or anything like that until uh, it just came out that wouldn't leave your life. Uh, so he reveals to you that he's jealous for you, jealous of your companions, and uh, there's actually several revelations that uh, uh, are overlapped in the whole story that is, I, I don't think it's important to go through all that. The Lord uh, speaks to him and then touches him and puts his hand on him, and the Lord does a powerful work in his uh, heart, and his chemistry is changed, and some really holy things happen that, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you, uh, that's probably enough on that subject, yeah. but so that happens when you're about 21 years old. Well, uh, uh, to, to recall the instance the way it actually happened, I was engaged at that particular time, and uh, so it did finally work around to where I realized the Lord uh, had uh, called me to, to celibacy. And there was one thing the angel of the Lord said, uh, uh, if I wanted the highest purposes of the Lord, calling my life, uh, I would have to consider the fact that he walked alone. I didn't know what that meant, you know. But I later knew what that meant. And then, of course, there was a lot of heartbreak and, and calling up an engagement that was quite uh, far along. Well, that's heavy. We all, I just feel the weight of that. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the details of that, I'll, I'm just going to pass those up. But uh, that's an awesome thing. So as a young man, you don't fully understand what you're getting into. You don't... <clears throat> understand the implications of uh, living alone for all those years and I know you've shared some of the uh, feelings and the emotions of Lord you've seen all your friends and you know families and children and grandchildren and and uh, you go home to a, uh, or a hotel room by yourself or home and to you know to just wait on the Lord and pray day in and day out and there's been a real price that the Lord's uh, required of you but he said that for you uh, the calling that you had, he actually required that of you? Did he give you an option no, or was it a requirement? Um, I don't think it was uh, interpreted as not not call to celibacy. I later realized that's what it was. Okay, good. Let's, uh, <clears throat> anything else about dating? You want to move on on that? Uh, no, uh, that was the end of that. But uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, there was an interesting thing that happened in Santa Maria because apparently I uh, ran through three red lights uh, after midnight there and the policeman stopped me and was looking for a passenger in the back seat and looking, shining his light in the floorboard of the car on the passenger side. And he kept exclaiming, where is he? Where is he? And I said, what do you mean? But at this time he was around on the driver's side talking to me and I, I said, what do you mean? He said, where is the man that was sitting in this seat talking to you? And I said, oh. <laughs> that was the Lord. 
And uh, so I could see his flashlight shaking. And uh, it was about I, two or three could, in the morning, and you're driving uh, through. Well, it was way after midnight, and I could see, almost see the white flush of God on his face. And he said, "What did you say?" And I said, "It was the Lord." So I had my Bible on the dash. I always felt, you know, that I always did that. I put my Bible on the dash of the car, and I figured if I hit something, the Word of God would hit me first. <laughs> so uh, uh, he he looked at that and he said. Are you a, a minister? And I said, yes, I'm a, I'm a Christian minister. And he said, well, and you said that was the Lord? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, are you aware of the fact that you and uh, the Lord <laughs> sail right through three red lights <laughs> in downtown San Bernardino? And he said, I have never had a situation like this in my life. He said, I can't give the Lord a ticket. Because he can't, and he's looking for this man. He looks in the back seat. Yeah. He can't find it, figure out what happened to that man that you were talking to that he saw with his right. eyes. Now, he's very serious. I mean, this is not a, a silly little story. It's very, he can't very, give the Lord a ticket. very serious. And, uh, but he doesn't know what to do. He's frustrated. And he said, well, uh, I tell you what I'd be willing to do. If you and the Lord, and just a trembling in his voice, and just a play on words, if you and the Lord will get a motel room and uh, spend the rest of the night there, and then go to Los Angeles in the morning, he said, I'll forget this whole thing ever happened. He said, oh, Lord, would I, would I ever like to forget this whole thing ever happened? <laughs> so he's about to go out of his mind, and I'm enjoying every minute of it. So. Yeah. Okay, so the, uh, let's go back now. You're about 18, 19. The, pa the uh, uh, Baptist pastor tells you all of, I mean, tells about you around. You go to Memorial Assembly of God. It's your first sermon. You're going to preach. The word gets out that boy preacher knows all, sees all, tells all, you know. And, and so you gather. There's a crowd there. And uh, mm. what happens? So now, how do we get all the way back there? Because uh, well, we're going to go from there to Tulsa to okay, Sacramento. Okay, we'll go back. Well, anyway, that is exciting to tell about because... They advertised me extensively as the boy prophet, the boy wonder, that type of thing. And the place is just jammed with people. It's your first service. Yeah, the first service. And they told all these stories about uh, my ability to discern sins and uh, sickness and all that. Because they heard the uh, testimony from your Baptist pastor. Oh, my. They were so turned on. And uh, so the place was jammed with people full of excitement. But what they didn't know was I'd never preached before in my life except to those spikes. And um, so I stood before the mirror for days and practiced. I never will forget, I, I, I had Romans 12 for a text, and I tried to memorize it. And I would do uh, all these gestures, you know, that I thought Mordecai Ham did and, and uh, some of the evangelists of that day. And there was one prophetic person um, that really had the power of God on him, and he would shake when he would preach, and he had this, uh, both hands would go like that when he would preach, you know, and he would look out and preach like that. So I thought, well, I'll get, you know, I'll get this Mordecai Ham look, and... Uh, Which he was a great Baptist right. pastor. Right, and so this Pentecostal prophetic uh, over father, father, you know, uh, the, he would shake like that when he would uh, pray. So you got to put the two together. So I put the two together, and it was pretty good, I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> and so... I would back off, you know, and uh, and do this. Uh, uh, in America, in America. Say, I beseech you, therefore, you know, uh, brethren, by the mercies of God. Went, I had it down pat. But when I got to the meeting, I was sitting on the platform waiting for to be introduced. And I had a lot of preliminaries to know and a lot of singing and worship. And so, closer I got to being introduced, the more I... Uh, more stage fright I had, and I just started shaking violently. <laughs> out of so, stage fright? Right, just not out of the power of God. I don't think it was. The Lord used it, but it was uh, just uh, uh, a human thing. I was scared here again. So by the time I got to the, the podium, I was just shaking violently, and I, I finally got my Bible open, and I, uh, I got this going all right, but it was real. I mean, it, there wasn't anything <laughs> phony about it. 
Well, and this was real. But it was stage fright. It wasn't yeah, right. about moving. <laughs> okay. And so I uh, got uh, my hand up like that, and I just ready to say, I beseech you. And all of a sudden, I got so nervous and exhausted that my hand just came right down <laughs> like that. Both, both hands were shaking, but this one is pointing right to a man on the second row. Your eyes are closed. Yeah. And he, uh, he jumped straight up out of his seat, and he said, that's enough, little brother. Stop right there. And he just ran down and fell on his face on the altar. I thought, that's the strangest thing I've ever seen in my life. I wonder what on earth was wrong with him, you know? And then a few others began to run down and fall in the front. And uh, I was still shaking. I mean, I was just shaking violently, you know? But every time I'd point in a direction, there would be two or three people get up and come down. So his arms would get tired on this side and he'd rest yeah. and they'd go up here and oh, he something. never actually got a word out the whole night and the place is jam-packed, a full scale yeah. revival, repentance, etc. Not one word. Now this is a Pentecostal church. Not one word. He didn't Not, say but one word. someone stood and of course prophecies were not allowed. I mean, you know, the, uh, unless they were preceded by a long period of speaking in tongues and then someone would interpret. But for some reason, somebody stood up with a prophetic utterance, and it was a judgment type thing, and it turned out that great conviction was all there anyway, and everybody seemed to fall on their knees. And, uh, you know, and, and most of them that could get around the front were coming up front and just falling around the altars and around the front. So the word got out, Mike, that I caused all that, and that it was the great anointing. So the place was packed and everybody gathered. Yeah. And did you only have one meeting that night? Or, uh, or just that one meeting. But I didn't have anything to do with it. In fact, uh, I, I remember thanking the Lord for getting me out of it that way. But I didn't realize it was going to make me famous. Uh, so, I mean, the question I was asking, uh, did you only have one night meeting? Or did you, have, did you go back the next no, night? No, I didn't. That so was all I could One stand. night shot. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So then the word gets out in Tulsa. No, no, it doesn't. Actually, you go to Tulsa by the word of the Lord. Or? Yeah, right. I had a lot of invitations after that, and uh, I felt, uh, you know, that I wasn't to do anything with them, that I was, next time, I was really going to... So you're instantly right. famous, 18 years old, boy preacher, never yeah. given a sermon, but famous for, for bringing revival. Right, so um, I, I did participate in a couple of little meetings, and then that gave me such boldness that I could actually you know, feel the Lord's going to use me. And then I felt this leading to go to Tulsa. I think a lot of men felt a leading to go to Tulsa uh, somewhere later. But I really felt the Lord sent me there. One reason I believed, Mike, was because Raymond T. Ritchie, a man I greatly admired, had had that phenomenal success there in the healing ministry. So I felt that we would uh, uh, pick up on what happened there. And so I went to Tulsa to a fashionable AG church. Uh, I never will forget the man who pastored that church is still living and he's told this story in conventions that we've shared together all over the country. And Dr. William Ward was the pastor of Bethel Temple and the church was experiencing just a little bit of difficulty and, uh, and uh, the crowds were falling off. And So I went into Dr. Ward's office and I said, Dr. Ward, uh, Jesus has sent me to Tulsa and if you'll have me for a meeting, He'll fill this place and will uh, uh, save hundreds of souls and heal hundreds and hundreds of sick people. Well, Dr. Ward uh, tearfully said, uh, young man, I believe you and uh, you come back tomorrow and I'll let you know what we can do about this. So I had a board meeting and the board, of course, voted unanimously against me. They said, we can't have a, a novice in our church. Uh, we, we, you know, he hasn't had the experience, and, and we can't have a kid like this in our church, and so they turned me down. And now the Lord was sending you there. Yeah, the Lord was sending me there, but I was very ignorant, and I didn't uh, have any wisdom at all, but I did have revelation, uh, had a lot of revelation, and so I just bowed my head, closed my eyes, and so instantly I got a revelation, and I said, well, that's all right, Dr. Ward, don't feel bad. He's feeling very badly about all this. And I said, there's a revival tabernacle downtown, and it seats twice as many as, as your church, and it was kind of built off of the Raymond T. Ritchie meeting, the big tabernacle seat. 1,500 seat. 1,500, 2,000 people, a big old tabernacle one. So I said, that's all right, I'll just, uh, I said, the Lord wants me to go there. 
So I went there and told that pastor the same story. I said, I came to Bethel Temple, and they, uh, the Lord told me what would happen, and they turned me down. But if you'll have me, the Lord will do twice as for you what he's going to do for Bethel Temple. And boy, this uh, pastor, he, he said, well, kid, you may be just what we're looking for. He said, we're having trouble too, and we uh, have three radio broadcasts today. He said, I'll take a chance on you. He really believed my story. And so uh, he said, when do you want to start? I said, tonight. He said, I didn't have any sense at all. And so he said, well, uh, well, we can't do that. So we got to get on the radio and tell people about it and announce it. And he, he said, let's start Sunday night. I said, okay, that'll be great. And so he got me um, a room in a rooming house, a room and board, you know. And, uh, uh, but I remember I, I went on a fast. In those days, I, I thought a fast, you know, you weren't supposed to drink water, or eat food or anything. I was really, really... Uh, uh, different, and so I thought. Well, I was feeling a sense of immortality. I, you know, I would fast, and I'd never lose a pound, and I'd eat a stick of butter and a jar of mayonnaise and a loaf of bread, and never gain a pound. I mean, you know, I was really crazy. And so, uh, so he shut me up in this place, and I remember just uh, staying in there day and night until Sunday uh, came around without eating or uh, went on a total fast. No water. I was just about crazy by the time the meeting came around. Yeah, I just, yeah. So actually, you, you end up going seven full days. Is that true? Well, it wasn't quite seven days. Five to no, seven. It was, uh, it was uh, end of the week. That was about uh, Wednesday. And then I went, you know, to Sunday. But then, boy, I was loaded with revelation by the time uh, Sunday rolled around. Now, I remember you saying once, I think, that you didn't even sleep during that time. Is that true? You no, prayed night sleep. and day for... There was several sessions like that, my, because... Uh, the Lord really honored my ignorance, and I didn't know that uh, I was breaking natural laws. And uh, I wish I could go back and start all over again. I think I'd uh, could make it Sleep now. Sleep more and eat less butter and mayonnaise, right? Yeah, right. See, that's what I got a wife so. for, you know, to keep me from the butter and mayonnaise. But anyway, yeah. go ahead. And your wife fixed me some chili today, and you left it out of the refrigerator, Mike. And, uh, it's spoiled. It's spoiled now. If I was living back then, I would eat it. Uh, I would break a fast eating a bowl of chili and a, and a side order of mashed potatoes. Okay, so you gather the first night. The place is jam-packed, and uh, you're oh, yes. fasting, praying, staying up four or five days, no water, no sleep, and you're ready to go to Sunday night. Your first set of meetings fresh from this revival that broke out that he didn't say a word in. It's your first real service and the place is jam-packed near 2,000 people. So what happened? Um, I never could interpret uh, the, the amber light up until then. Uh, the, the little cloud of amber light would move uh, over the audience and settle on someone. And later, I know if it's settled over the chest or something, that person had probably lung trouble, heart trouble, or something like that. So, so the amber light would move over the whole room. Right. It was like a diagnostic thing. And I didn't know anything about diagnosis or anything like that. And I didn't know one disease from the other for the most part. I knew, you know, cancer and arthritis, and I knew some of the biggies and all that, but I didn't know some diseases uh, from the other. But anyway, this light settled over a little lady sitting in a green and white polka dot dress. And she was way back over in the left section. And it was just as real and as it was then. And uh, when I looked at that light over her, I knew her name. I knew where she was from. It was just the most amazing thing. And I don't remember her name, but I remember it saying, Lady, you're from San Antonio, Texas. That was really strange because this was in Tulsa. And uh, they'd had time to hear about that meeting, and they brought her in there, and she was the most crippled person in the building. Brought her in a wheelchair and parked her here in, in that particular uh, end of the aisle there. So uh, I said, uh, lady, you're crippled, uh, badly crippled with arthritis. The Lord says for you to, to get up and uh, walk out to that aisle and run, and you're completely healed. And so she shot straight up out of her chair, knocked her crutches over, her wheelchair was parked in the back, and I didn't even know that. And here she ran down that aisle, ran up and down the other aisle. Instantaneous miracle. Instantly healed, and all the crippling, deformative, so, naughty... So this is your type. first meeting, your first okay. time you called first it out? First time. And uh, I've heard Paul say that you didn't know if the gift would work in public. You knew it did in private, but you've never right. stood in front of a group of people. And so here's your first time, 
boom, this creative miracle takes right. place. And I don't want to use the vernacular of the street, but I knew that what the Lord had given me was a winner. I, I never, it would just work like you wouldn't believe. It just worked all night that night. And then finally we formed a prayer line. Uh, the pastor got the idea to get a power line going, so we had three deep all around the, uh, the auditorium, the tabernacle, and that's when I would pray until the wee hours of the night's morning, just pray for people until uh, uh, they would uh, take me off the platform. But should I tell a little humorous experience? Yes, absolutely. Well, uh, we, we've had this prayer line formed. How about the lady with the nose? At first, yes. Okay. Uh, the first person in the prayer line was a precious little lady, and she was a pretty lady, and she had the cutest little nose. And the Lord, uh, of course, in his way, the angel of the Lord told me what was wrong with her, that she had colditis, uh, I thought he said, and I didn't know what that was. He thought it was colditis. Yeah, colditis, so I thought, well, uh, you know, I knew where that might, uh, you know, I thought that was some kind of a bad cold or uh, something like that. So I, I just reached out and took hold of her little nose, and I said, oh, you old colitis, I command you to come out of here in the name of Jesus. Well, she had the sweetest little accommodating smile on her face, but the power of the Lord went through her and healed her, and she was instantly healed of chronic uh, colitis, you know. So the angel of the Lord would come and stand at your side, which still happens, happens through the years, and, mm. and would speak into your ear and say these, these uh, parts of the anatomy that you didn't yeah. have a clue what was going on. Yeah, well, he was real good on the uh, disease part, but he never, you know, taught me anything about the human anatomy. I mean, I, I didn't know much about body ministry. Yeah. So, uh, so, I've heard Paul, just for time's sake, we've got about seven or eight minutes, so... Uh, he talked about that night, that his first night here, the glory of God, this light, which was a manifestation of the glory of God, was bouncing all the room like a ping pong ball. I've heard you say that at meetings before. Yeah. Falling on this one, if they had a bad arm, this glory would rest on their arm. If they had, you know, a headache, it would rest on the back of their head. Just wherever the person's ailment would, the, the light of the Lord would fall upon them. And so then he began to call out people in sin. He would call this one and say, Well, right, I'd tell them that they were having something to do with uh, the, uh, the other one, you know, across the room and tell how they were dressed. And so that caused a lot of problems. So he'd say, this man over here is messing around with this woman. He, as he says, he goes, I didn't know what messing around meant. But uh, he would say that messing around and begin to call them out. And so finally the pastor uh, gets really disturbed by this. And he comes to him and says, uh, uh, I heard a story so many times, I almost put it word for word. He said, little brother, he said, uh, your expertise is... Uh, healing the sick he said uh and discerning uh, and discerning god didn't call you to call sins out he goes your expertise is you know the the sick and and uh go ahead and comment on that yeah well he said of course i didn't know what what that was he said you have to employ more finesse and i didn't know what that was either so i said well what's that what's finesse and, yeah so he said well uh, you need to back off take it easy he said uh, you know you need to move in your area in your area is to discern sickness and diseases and the Lord's made you an expert in that so you do that and don't do anything else that's that's where the secret of your power is and so uh, uh, he made me promise I wouldn't do that anymore but of course you know I had that uh, prophetic the angel of the Lord would come the word of knowledge would be there and you'd call the guy out and send the next night yeah well I had that prophetic cocky spirit you know and I said well you know I can't disobey God and I so I I halfway promised I wouldn't do it, but I said, I can't tell you for sure, though. And so a few nights later, I hit it again, and uh, that's when I really got in trouble. So this uh, uh, revival or series of meetings went on for three weeks. The governor of Oklahoma was there, and great uh, you know, news went out everywhere, great uh, creative miracles, calling out sin. Finally, this pastor got so disturbed by this, he called up a, a fellow uh, pastor in Sacramento, a friend of his, and said, Brother, he said, we got this most remarkable young man. He said, uh, incredible uh, discernment of diseases and healing. He didn't tell him about the sin part. And he said, you need him right now. He's the greatest thing ever happened to our church because he was nailing the deacons, the leaders of the community, and this chaos. And they were telling him, you've got to shut this kid down. He's causing so much trouble. And so uh, his pastor ships him off to Sacramento, but he doesn't tell the Sacramento pa pastor about the sin. So then he comes to Paul and says, uh, boy, you know, the Lord really needs you in Sacramento because you know there's more sin in California anyway. 
He says, and they need you more out there. So they ship him out to Sacramento, and uh, the whole thing breaks out there again. Go ahead and touch on that. Do we have time to tell yeah, that yeah, part of yeah, This is really exciting, because when I, I was really top-heavy when I got to Sacramento. I don't mean I had some sense, but I had less sense and more revelation So you're talking about being cocky is what you mean? Oh, yeah, I was really strutting uh, like a prophet. I mean, I really had uh, knowledge, but I didn't have any wisdom. And so I thought that they were calling for me to be a troubleshooter for the church, to clean up the church, to tell the, 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 the you know, to point the people out uh, that were living in sin. Because you didn't know that the uh, Tulsa guy didn't tell the other guy what you were doing. No, because he set me up good. And he said, you know, there's more sin in California than there is in Oklahoma, and uh, you can really enjoy doing this out there. And uh, he didn't have any mercy on that pastor at all. He really set him up. So when I first got there, I was sitting on the, on the platform. And before I ever got to the podium, I looked out trying to find sin. And guess where I found it? Uh, the fix and take the offering. And the ushers were stationed, uh, a couple of them in each aisle. And uh, the auditorium was jammed out with people. And I looked over here in this aisle right here. There was a big, heavy, brawny uh, usher, six foot three or four. And he was standing there, you know, piously holding the offering bag. And so I nailed him. I mean, the Lord showed me exactly what's going on. I looked over and there's a lady sitting over here in a blue dress. The Lord, or the, the knowledge or whatever, I can't explain that to you. That's his wife and he has two children. And I looked at him and so I shot straight up out of my chair. Around it's the, the opening night, right? Pardon? It's just opening night? This was the opening service. Boy, I didn't waste any time. I, I was trying to spot the worst. Well, so this is what find. he did for fun. He said, I spent so many days shut in, didn't get to go do this yeah. and that. It's the funnest thing he had, most excitement he ever had in his life was going out soon. Go ahead. I enjoyed seeing those big people squirm. I was just a little guy, so I pointed this guy out and I said, that same thundering authoritative voice. And I had a deep voice for a boy then. It was probably deeper than it is now. I said, you old hypocrite. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. I mean, that was kind of a uh, masculine Catherine Kuhlman type thing. And uh, I said, you see this lady sitting over here in the blue dress with the two children? That's your wife. Well, you know what? He knew that. But I didn't know that. And I said, shame on you, brother. See this lady sitting back here in that rust uh, uh, dress, that red dress? I said, that's the woman you're running off with after these meetings. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, you old hypocrite, thus saith the Lord. Well, he dropped his offering bag and he ran toward the podium. And all these ushers, you know, they came out of uh, the sections to restrain him. I said, Leave him alone. He can't hurt the man of God. 18 pounds, 18 yeah. 120 pounds, leave him alone. Yeah, and so here I was leaning oh, on one arm on the lower part of that big old pulpit, just as smart aleck as could be. He came looking at me, fell on his knees, rolled his big brown eyes up. I remember his brown eyes because he looked like a, 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 a pitiful had, you know, in a hailstorm, and his face was wet with tears. I didn't feel any, any sorrow, any compassion or mercy at all. I hated sin with a passion because I felt I was so pure that I just hated anything that wasn't pure. I mean, that's the way I felt. And so I looked at him, and he looked up at me, just tears wetting his face, and he said, Oh, little brother, it's all true. What on earth am I going to do? And here was the word of wisdom. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't move in that area. <laughs> we got to take it. We just have a, just a few seconds left. Uh, what I'm going to say is that we've got this whole. Uh, an in-depth one because it goes on prayed for some creative miracles and the story about him trying to raise someone from the dead the most humorous incredible story and we have a tape called uh, Paul's, Paul's earlier ministry we he has about eight or nine parts of this story that is the most hilarious thing and so we make that available Man. Well, that's
session, Paul, we were talking about the uh, way that you uh, uh, were introduced into your national ministry at age 18, 19 in Tulsa and Sacramento, and we uh, didn't uh, get into a lot of that, but I think that we uh, don't have time really to go back to that. So I uh, spoke about the uh, tape for the rest, for all of you and, the, and those that are hearing this tape, that uh, we have that on a tape called Paul's uh, Early Years in Ministry, and it's just a very refreshing and uh, just a wonderful story and the different things that happened there but let's uh, skip that and go right to the Europe trip I think it was it was it 1958 I don't have that written down now the uh, angel of the Lord speaks to you about going to Europe your mother gets some input William Branham give us a little bit of what was going on with that it, it was in 1957 I, uh, I don't want to take any more time on the uh, the stories of the last session but I would like to say that there was more to those meetings than just calling out sins and uh, uh, tremendous miracles, healings, and people were really helped. The creative but miracles. we even had creative miracles. But the problem was the revelations were quite strong. The revelational uh, knowledge was there, but uh, there wasn't the understanding, the application, and that sort of thing. So I don't want to leave it like that. I'd like for people to know there's more than just uh, the haphazard uh, uh, way of calling out sin. There was a, a wonderful thing going on, uh, building faith, faith uh, coming by hearing the word of God even, uh, and, and people were healed. So that was not the major part of the meeting. That was just uh, a few isolated in in incidents. And, Paul, uh, 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 make that clear. He often talks about those years and how much uh, wisdom he lacked and how he uh, did not distinguish between the revelation, the interpretation, and the application. That's some principles that he's taught us over the years. That you can get a revelation, but the ability to interpret that revelation is a whole other thing. And then the ability to apply the interpretation is another thing. And sometimes the uh, vessel that has the revelation itself doesn't always use it with godly application. And, uh, and he would call out sins sometimes recklessly. He said that there was times where he... Uh, was cocky and he was this and he was that and he was just having the time of his life and the Lord began to deal with him that the reason these revelations were given was to edify the body to help people and uh, I, I like that uh, the divine humor when the Lord spoke to you about you know leaned over heaven and said if I don't give this boy some wisdom uh, Phil, yeah, well, it was just I could envision him now in retrospect you know looking over the balcony of heaven and saying if I don't give this kid some wisdom he's going to wreck my kingdom because uh, I really was well on my way for doing just that. So, uh, the uh, Europe, let, let, let's go to 1957, you're in your 20s at this time, maybe, maybe 20, 29, something like that, and uh, uh, how, uh, he goes to Germany and speaks to crowds of 30,000 people a night. Perhaps, this is my own commentary, the largest meetings of this type in, in the history of Germany, where the power of God was flowing, supernatural miracles, and I believe that that was a prophetic signpost in those early years even about Paul's this is now me speaking this is Paul speaking and I believe that he's going to have a major role in Germany in the days to come because the Lord established that in the 50s with him uh, William Branham was planned to go to Germany but the Lord interrupted him and tell us what the Lord told uh, William Branham what the Lord told you and what he told your mother well by 1957 it seemed as though I had uh, arrived I mean I had gotten away from the sensational part of the ministry and uh, thought I knew how to hear from God and thought I knew something about that application and you know knew how to interpret uh, the wisdom that came from above or the knowledge so I was in a, a, a denominational church having a meeting in Seattle Washington and um, one night after the meeting uh, there was a, a dream a ministry to uh, a mass of people in Europe. I don't know how I knew it was Europe, but I just knew in the dream that that represented Europe, perhaps Germany, and uh, uh, there was just a sea of faces out there. And I knew it was a prophetic dream and that I was to go to Europe uh, immediately, it seemed. And uh, I didn't know how to do that. I'd never been overseas. Uh, up until that time and um, so uh, the next morning I got up and made plans uh, to uh, to go to Europe so I thought uh, we were having 
uh, a large attendance in this meeting. There were affluent people in the meeting, and I thought it would be a good time to take an offering to go to Europe. And I just knew there'd be enough people there that would give enough money for me to go to Europe. And I was looking forward uh, to that. And then uh, planned all day on how to take an offering and get enough money. I knew it was going to take a lot of money to go that far away and to do all those things and uh, to see all that happened because that kind of crowd could only come by spending, you know, a lot of money. So, uh, man's like way. Like advertising and repairing right. a hole and because you didn't understand where the crowd was going to come from because as far as you knew, nobody ever heard of you in Germany. No, I thought it would have to come by promotion like, uh, like we'd been accustomed to and, and a lot of PR work and that sort of thing. Well, anyway, I, I was in for the shock of my life. I got ready to go to the meeting and had everything down pat, knew how to uh, pray over uh, the offering and how to get things going that night. And so, just before I left, I had my secret weapon with me. My mother I was staying in another room, and she came out of uh, the hotel room or the motel room, and she said, Son, I don't want to interfere with your ministry or your business, but I've had a visitation from the Lord, and he told me to tell you not to take that offering tonight. And so I thought, well, it my mother's really, I thought, you know, she never misses it, but she missed it this time because I want to go to Europe. And uh, I said, Mom, you don't understand. This is very, very serious. And uh, she said, oh, yes, I do understand. The Lord also told me that you were going to Europe right away, but you won't need a penny. Uh, you're not to ask for money. You won't need a penny. Your way is going to be paid around the world. And uh, I thought, oh, my, you know, this is just took all the air out of my uh, air castle or my balloon, now, so to now speak. Now, you had told her you were going to Europe. She oh, she knew revolution. nothing, absolutely nothing about it. That's, uh, uh, that's one of the unique things about, about the situation. So I was so depressed. Uh, I didn't know uh, but what my mother had missed at that time. I couldn't figure out, you know, why the Lord would tell her I was going to Europe because she had no way of knowing that. It was in my dream. I didn't tell her about that. And so I went to the meeting and got so frustrated that we didn't even take an offering that night for any reason, let alone a, a missionary offering, so we didn't even pass the plates. Did you forget or purposely did not? Just forgot. <laughs> and so I came home more frustrated because I thought, well, uh, here this golden opportunity. We've missed it. There's no way to raise enough money to go to Europe now, and I know that I'm going to have to go right away. And uh, we're already, uh, you know, right into... Uh, almost the month of July there, and, and I'm to go. I kn knew that I was to go in July to Europe. Well, that night, uh, it seemed like it was after midnight, the telephone rang, and uh, Brother William Branham uh, was calling, and he was in Jeffersonville, Indiana, and so uh, after a little small talk, he said, Brother Paul, uh, I'll get right to the reason I'm calling, he said, how would you like to go to Europe? And I said, well, you know, it took me by surprise. And I said, to Europe? Did I hear you right? And he said, yes, how would you like to go to Europe? And here, you think you've arrived, you think you know everything by now. And uh, I didn't even know that the Lord was setting me up. And so I said, uh, well, I said, I'd, uh, I, I think I'd like to go to Europe. I said, this is kind of unique. I had a, a dream. Um, uh, the night before and told him about it and uh, told him how all this came about. He didn't seem too impressed with that. But he just said, you know, uh, the angel of the Lord came to me and told me not to go to Europe, but to send my brother Paul in my stead. And he said, here's the, uh, here's the way it's coming down. Um, there will be a cloud over Switzerland, and if you go there, uh, they won't do anything to you, but if I go there, they'll arrest me, and they have all these charges trumped up against me. They're going to accuse me of black magic and witchcraft. He said, a little boy's raised from the dead over in Finland, and the state church is going to bring charges against me. Now, he knew this by revelation. He knew it all by revelation. But he said, the angel of the Lord told me, if I send you, they can't do anything to you, and uh, you can minister in my stead. And he said, our ministers are similar, so you can uh, take my meetings. And I said, oh my, I said, but there's a problem. Uh, here's the carnal mind is working again. I said, there's a problem. Brother, I don't have any money. I uh, don't have any money in reserve. And I have um, 
I have a unique thing here. Um, our meeting just closed tonight, and uh, I thought the Lord had shown me to take an offering. And uh, he said, oh, brother, let me, let me tell you something. He said, uh, you won't need a penny. Your way will be paid around the world. Just like your mother said. Yeah, just like my mother had said, you know, the, <laughs> earlier that evening. So uh, it was kind of exciting. And he said, yes, we're going to buy you a ticket around the world and told me all the places I'd be going, you know. And then we went to a couple of meetings of his in, in Ireland. And then we went to uh, the big Europe-wide meeting in Karlsruhe, Germany. Where and where? Karlsruhe, Germany, Karlsruhe, Germany, uh, where uh, 30,000 people attended nightly. And the mayor of the city of Karlsruhe sponsored a thousand refugees from uh, the Russian zone, from the, behind the Iron Curtain, to come to that meeting every night. So we had uh, 1,500 people come to the, the Lord in, in each uh, of those meetings. Uh, so a little less than a week, we had uh, the newspapers uh, reported 180,000 people in attendance. You mean that night by night, uh, uh, adding it all up? Adding it all up. There now, were 30,000 people a night. Now, how, how long did this uh, series of meetings go? Did it go one week? or The meeting uh, was a little over a week, about a week. And so uh, the angel of the Lord visits and sends you there, and great uh, supernatural miracles took place. Can you tell the miracle of, or the thing that happened? I think it was a policeman, if I remember that right. Uh, that was a meeting in Stuttgart, Germany, where we were in uh, an auditorium there, and a lot of policemen were there, and the state church was sponsoring the meeting, the, the Lutheran church. And uh, uh, one night there was uh, a lady standing before me at a power line, praying for a lot of people in, in the healing line. And there was a lady standing before me with a, a monstrous gorder on the side of her throat. Uh, about the size of a grapefruit, a good size grapefruit. And um, here the, the spirit of uh, revelation and prophecy at the same time came on me, and maybe a little bit of faith. <laughs> but I looked at her and I said something by revelation and by, pro by a prophetic uh, voice and a prophetic utterance. <clears throat> Excuse me, I said, Sister, the goiter on your throat is going to disappear in 15 seconds. If I am a man of God, that goiter will disappear in 15 seconds. Now that just well, came out of your lips, didn't it? Uh, but, yes, and, and, and you know, before the interpreter could interpret it, I would have given anything in the world had I grabbed him, you know, and just, you know, at that particular t moment in time, I just wanted to uh, stop him from saying that because between the time those words left my mouth, and he was giving the interpretation. I froze uh, in my uh, tracks. I thought, oh, Lord. I saw those policemen out there, and I'd never, you know, known the, an experience of being tired and feathered, but I felt I was going to be tired and feathered and thrown in jail or thrown out of town. 15 seconds it was going to get yeah, you in 15 trouble. seconds. So that was the longest 15 seconds of my entire life. And... Uh, here I was acting out that faith and had my hand on that massive goiter. And then all of a sudden I felt that goiter disintegrating and melting. And it just went down like, a, like letting air out of a balloon. And then I got real cocky and real smart, you know. <laughs> and um, it was just a real joy to play games with that massive... Uh, a uh, piece of uh, skin, I would slap it and it would just wrap around, halfway around her throat, and we just played all kinds of games with that. And, uh, while the audience just, just went wild. And so uh, that was something. It, that brought a lot of people to the Lord, and uh, even uh, a couple of the state church pastors said they got saved. And it was a wonderful thing. And so, near 1,500 people night, as far as you can remember, were getting saved in the meeting and the the well, not the Carlsruhe meeting. I'm uh, not the uh, Stuttgart meeting, but the Carlsruhe meeting, yes. So where did they have a building for 30,000 people? It was called uh, the Tent Cathedral. It was very unusual. They had uh, big uh, A-frame type warehouse structures, and uh, uh, then they stretched canvas over, over these uh, frames, and it didn't look anything like a tent, but it was called uh, And And did they cathedral. erect it for the meetings? 
It was erected for the meeting. And so right. then afterwards, uh, the purpose of that structure was moved. And so on. They used to do that in the old days for um, <coughs> evangelists. No one. So do, do you think there was any prophetic significance, and maybe I'm putting you on the line here, uh, prophetic significance about you going to Germany with such a, in a, such a supernatural way and uh, some of the things that we've been hearing in the spirit about Germany in the days to come, do you think there's any link between your purpose then and your purpose in the future? Well, I think there is. Uh, another thing that my uh, little mom saw before I left, she said, you know, this testimony of uh, my call and her healing uh, would precede me everywhere I would go. It was going to be published in the language of the people I minister to. And when I stood in Germany and gave uh, this testimony, my mom's healing, my call to the ministry, I asked, uh, you know, just playfully, uh, has anyone here heard uh, about this, uh, this uh, uh, testimony? And half the audience lifts their hands, about no, 15,000 15, people lift their hands. And I thought, boy, these people respond to anything I wonder <laughs> if they could understand the interpreter. And so I had a fine interpreter. He was an English uh, professor. And uh, so I asked again, and he said, uh, Mr. Kane, you don't understand. He said there was a book published before you came to Europe uh, on William Branham's life and uh, your life by a German theologian, and it's had uh, uh, widespread all through the German-speaking part of uh, the country. And uh, you're well known in Germany, brother. And it was just uh, one of those marvelous things. And then when we got down to Switzerland, the same thing happened. There was a book printed in uh, the French language, and it included uh, uh, the testimony of my mother and, and my call to the ministry. But it was a little embarrassing because it was published in a book right along with um, General Booth, uh, who founded the Salvation Army, D.L. Moody, and a lot of the big names, and here uh, I was thrown in with all these great uh, uh, dignitaries, and it was very embarrassing. They didn't, what, uh, yeah, they didn't know what. they didn't know what I was important to because of that testimony. So, so uh, the, Lord works the angel of the Lord actually told your mother that wherever you would go in terms of other nations, that the story would precede you. Right. And so that is that something that's happened over the years. Something well, it really has. So we have this invitation to South America. And uh, the Bible school over there is using the old life story book that was published 40 years ago, or a textbook. And so there's a lot of young men looking for a young 18-year-old uh, Paul Cain to <laughs> appear over there. And they don't know that this book is antedated. <laughs> and, uh, came from the... Uh, and, and just a little while, we're going to talk a little bit about William Branham because he was such, such an unusual... Uh, had such an unusual ministry, very similar to the way Paul's ministry is now, a tremendous accuracy of revelation. Uh, but before we do that, I want to hit a couple more things. Uh, Raymond T. Ritchie, uh, he uh, was with you on that trip, is that right? Uh, Raymond T. Ritchie... Uh, uh, tell, tell him who he, he was and a little bit about him. You mentioned him last night, but go ahead. Well, he was one of the classic uh, evangelists uh, of a certain era, and he was probably the best-known healing evangelist of his day. In the 40s? Uh, yes, in, in the early 40s, even in the mid-40s. And uh, he was a prophetic uh, person and uh, had a tremendous healing ministry. It would lead uh, sometimes uh, 10,000 people in a parade in a street like uh, uh, Tulsa. I think the Tulsa Globe uh, published uh, reports of the Parade of Miracles where he led 10,000 people down the street had been delivered from all manner of sicknesses, diseases, and wheelchairs, special devices, and all that sort of thing. So uh, I can't say that he was my mentor or anything, but he and William Branham were the, the greatest men of God in my life. But uh, of course, uh, Brother Richie seemed to precede Brother Branham's ministry somewhat. And when I was a little boy, I used to listen to Raymond T. Ritchie on the radio, and I fell in love with his uh, presentation of the gospel and his healing ministry. And I used to say, Lord, forget about me uh, when I grow up. Just let me uh, carry that man's suitcases for him. Let me, uh, let me travel with that man. I just really loved Raymond T. Ritchie. He was uh, a real father type 
uh, man of God, just a, had a, a father spirit. And, and so it was a unique thing. I just wanted to, uh, to be, uh, to be so, with that man. And so he actually uh, ended up as an older man and you're in your 20s uh, going to Europe with you. And so this right. he, he dream was a, comes true. He was an older man then and so he flew to Europe yes. all across those miles there just to be in those meetings. And when you see the Lord use me, after the meeting, he would sit across from me at a table and, and would weep. And he said, uh, you know, this is the thrill of my life. I'm living my life over again, just seeing God use you. I, I'm living uh, those days all over again, how the Lord, you know, when the Lord used me. So he was just a, a precious uh, man of God. Yeah, uh, Raymond T. Richie, just say a few things. More about him. It's a name that uh, most of us uh, should acquaint ourselves with because he's truly one of the fathers of the Pentecostal movement in America in some ways. You know, in the late 30s and the 40s, a tremendous healing, uh, tremendous meetings of thousands of people, creative miracles. He, I think, was based in Houston. Is that right? Right. He was. Uh... And uh, he was most known for uh, his deep dedication, like you were in your youth. Uh, for hours and hours uh, in the presence of the Lord. I have known a few people who, who are older, but they were younger and they knew him and they were friends and used to travel with him. They said he would spend sometimes five and eight hours a day, five and six days a week in prayer before the meetings. He would lock himself up. He was a uh, very, very thin man, very frail man, and uh, was always broken uh, so often in his health and his strength because of prayer and fasting. They said he almost fasted his life away and but he would go to those meetings and the power of God would break forth and I've heard a, a number of people firsthand tell the uh, incidents it's just an amazing thing and so many uh, people in my generation aren't, aren't familiar with his name and I just want to throw that name out Raymond T. Ritchie he was one of the few who went down with great honor at the end so often uh, those that had power for a five or ten year period ended up in some kind of infamy but Raymond T. Ritchie went to his grave uh, in the power of God with purity and instead, like so often, there was jealousy. You know, when a man had power for five or ten years and became well known, the competitiveness, Paul will talk about a little bit later, the jealousy, but this was a man who was so committed to the younger men under him, even going beyond where he was. And so uh, Paul wouldn't tell this, but uh, I just know because I've, you know, talked to Reed and those that have known you, but actually Raymond T. Ritchie ended up carrying Paul's luggage from meeting to meeting just as a statement of support to him. And Paul... In those times, he would just weep and weep over that because uh, Raymond T. Ritchie had no way of knowing how Paul uh, was so endeared by him. And so uh, I, just, I just think that's just a marvelous thing. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth was in the 40s as well, 30s and 40s. And, and did right. you ever meet him or right. know much never, about him? Or? I never met him, but I met his sequel. Uh, Jack Cole had uh, a ministry much like Wigglesworth. In fact, he was the modern uh, Wigglesworth of my uh, day there. Okay, we're going to get into Branham and A.A. Allen and Jack Coe in a moment. Anything else that, that, that your mother, uh, she would give you all these things ahead of time. Uh, you know, like the lady in the wheelchair, you've told that story often, or the man, that, the boy that got the cancer in his tongue. Can you tell us about those? Well, there was hundreds of incidents like that when my mom would travel with me. She'd uh, tell me what was going to happen before I went to service that night. Usually the message I was going to preach said, well, you've got a good one tonight. Uh, I said, well, you sure, Mom? You sure this is what the Lord wants you to speak on? Oh, yes. She said, you're going to uh, speak on, but we see Jesus. You know that's my favorite, and that's the one you're going to speak on tonight. And I said, don't you overlook that lady in a blue dress in that wheelchair. She has faith to be healed tonight, and she's going to walk out of that wheelchair. If you uh, call on her at the right time, she's going to be healed. And so that boy there, you know, uh, uh, his, his wife... Uh, is there with him and uh, this is her birthday and be a wonderful birthday present for the Lord to heal her husband he has cancer of the tongue and oh my you know stuff like that and so a lot of times I go I said call this pick you know the Lord would show me who that girl was I called her out and I said this is your birthday isn't it she said yes as a matter of fact it is I said well you have a wonderful birthday present on the way from the Lord I said your husband's here tonight and she said yes sir the way has cancer the time, doesn't he? And boy, I tell you, she just uh, about collapses, you know. So I said, well, the Lord's going to heal your, uh, your husband the cancer of the time. So he comes up, and uh, I didn't get to preach that night because when the Lord healed that boy, cancer of the tongue, he got saved, he got healed, and got filled with the Holy Spirit, called to preach, and he preached the message that night. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> it 
was amazing. What, what happened to the lady in the wheelchair? When she, uh, of course, got up and, uh, and, and was healed, she really did have faith to be healed. It was uh, and so experience. your mother operated like her mother and then her mother, and so you and your mother were like double trouble to the king to the kingdom uh, of darkness when you got in unity together. She really was. One night, uh, she said, don't overlook the lady on the front row with the uh, cancer of the breast. You know that I have a, a sensitivity for things like that, so that if the Lord heal me. And uh, I didn't have an ounce of faith for the lady on the front row. She'd been there for several nights, and uh, the stench of that cancer was so horrible that uh, I don't know how people could stand to, to be around her. And here she was, night after night, and I never, never had the faith to call her out. And it was something my mother felt uh, uh, in the spirit that if I exercised that kind of... Uh, uh, the faith to call her out, the Lord would do the rest. So I did, and that woman's still living today. I mean, she was, uh, I mean, it would, it would be an impossibility for a massive cancer of that size or tumor of that size to, uh, and that open uh, bleeding cancer. It was just, uh, she was in the last stages of it, but she's still living today, and that's. Uh, so now, now your mother wasn't actually in those meetings. Is that right? Or, 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 you know, is the uh, situation she was sitting there in the meetings and saw the lady and then told you afterwards? Or no, was she, no, she not even attending she, the she service? She wouldn't be in the meetings at that time. This, uh, uh, this is a unique thing about my mom. She didn't like to be made over, and the people would make over because of her testimony. And all. She couldn't stand that, so she stayed uh, behind the scenes, stayed in the hotel room or in the, in the motor home in the last days there, and uh, she, she prayed, and the Lord would show her these things. Oh, what a combination. Uh, let's talk about the uh, time uh, when the angel appeared in front of uh, several thousand people at one time. And the Koreans and, and that was uh, testimony. That's really a marvelous one. Well, well that was an exciting time. Uh, Reed uh, was traveling with me at the time. and this Reed is, hasn't traveled with me for This is about, in the 60s? Uh, or, I mean, 70s, this happened? Uh, let's see. Uh, no, this was uh, after 79. It must have been 1980. Uh, before Reed Grafke, my present assistant. Uh, he hasn't traveled with me for about three years, but he was traveling with me at that time. And uh, we um, went to um, Los Angeles to, to minister at a camp meeting in uh, the Mojave Desert, I believe it was. And so um, I had a vision out there that I would be preaching to uh, a large group of Koreans. And so Reed was sitting at the meetings for me, and he said, well, that's highly unlikely. This is a, a camp meeting. And uh, he said, I'll call the, 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 the host pastor and, and find out for you if you want me to. But he said, I don't, I don't think there will be any Koreans there. And um, so he called, and uh, he asked if there would be Koreans in me. He said, well, I don't think so. He said, there's always an Oriental or two. You know, there might be uh, uh, some Chinese, or there might be some Orientals in the meeting. but." Uh, not that I know of, I mean, but there might be. Oh, he said, no, Brother Paul had a vision of preaching to hundreds and hundreds of uh, Koreans and, and Oriental people in this meeting. He said, no, I'm, I'm afraid uh, he's off on this one. So uh, uh, it was so real, Mike, that I just knew that the Lord gave me that vision. But anyway, we uh, went to the campgrounds, and uh, there uh, had been, uh, that there was... Um, a uh, Presbyterian church, or the largest, I guess the largest Korean church in Los Angeles, um, had booked the campgrounds, and uh, there was a double booking by mistake, and uh, they were there for their conference at the same time we were there for our camp meeting. And so here, all of these hundreds of Koreans were there, and we had the tabernacle, and so um, they got the, the idea that uh, we would merge the meetings, you know, and uh, because they didn't have a place big enough for their, uh, for their evening meetings. So they brought all their people in. Here I was ministering, ministering that night to so all these Koreans. So I began to tell the story, my mother's healing, and the angel coming to her. And the angel appeared uh, in the window at the side of the tabernacle, and these Koreans trampled each other. They all uh, now, we're talking about conservative, uh, a Presbyterian pastor, 
is people going wild, trampling one another, walking on each other to touch this angel. Now, were the Koreans Presbyterians? Yes, they were, uh, some were spirit-filled, but, uh, oh, it was awesome. And so, uh, uh, so the pastor wasn't there that night, the Presbyterian pastor, and you can imagine how it blew him away when these uh, members were telling him what happened the night before, you know, because he uh, was evangelical and didn't, uh, you know, didn't quite believe in those things. But anyway, uh, it was so convincing that finally he invited us uh, uh, to uh, Los Angeles to his church <coughs> that weekend, and the Lord showed up, and uh, so that some prophecies were given, and that has become the largest, uh, fastest growing church in America. In the, uh, the Korean church. The Korean church, right. Uh, I had an opportunity to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to meet a man that was at that meeting, and he said that uh, three or four thousand people saw an eight-foot angel. And they, uh, they were all filled the room and just the holy hush. And it was so awesome. They were stunned and they stared. Everybody was looking over the right. And Paul was kind of preaching and telling the testimony. And, and if I remember right, because we haven't talked <laughs> over some of these stories for a while, uh, you didn't even look over there. Is that, is that right? No, I was busy doing whatever it is I do. I <laughs> could imagine why they were disturbing, uh, you know, being... Uh, then everybody, I mean, not everybody, but hundreds jump up and they're rushing over because they want to touch this angel. And this uh, angel's appearing, an eight-foot angel, like I said, three or four thousand are, are seeing it. Like I said, I got to talk to a man that was actually in the meeting. He said it was the most awesome, terrifying thing. And uh, I don't think any of them ever talk, touched him. I didn't ask them, but they all ran over there. And, it, and the angel, I think, appeared about four minutes, three to four minutes total. And uh, there were other examples. Uh, I know that you don't like getting into this, where, so I, I'll just barely touch it. Uh, where several times in the last number of years, angels have appeared in the meetings that Paul's ministered at, and all the people, or half the people, saw the angel appear right in front of the uh, thousands at a time. And uh, I know that the Lord has spoken to you, as well as many others, that the appearance of angels uh, ministering uh, spirits, uh, Hebrews 1.14, you know, to minister to those that inherit salvation, they're, they're going to have an integral role in the end time ministry, even the actual appearance of them to massive numbers at a time. And uh, so that's really something uh, to uh, consider. Obviously, you know, there's going to be the counterfeit. We understand that. But, I mean, those that are, that are uh, standing true to the testimony of Jesus, that are honoring the work of the Holy Spirit, that are upholding the Word of God. And so uh, do you have anything to say about what you see about the future and the angels' involvement in the end-time ministry? Do you got a sentence or two to add to well, that? Well, there seems to be a lot of uh, uh, criticism from... Uh, even evangelical circles about angels, but if Jesus uh, had them come and minister to him, uh, I don't, I don't think there's any harm in having them minister to us. <laughs> so uh, I believe that uh, if it happened to him, the sinless, spotless Son of God, and if he needed all these things, you know, like uh, uh, signs and wonders to endorse his ministry, where on earth does that leave us? We need, uh, we need everything we can get. And so if the angels are, uh, are, are paying visits, I, I want to be on the list. So uh, Billy Graham wrote a book on angels and gave some insight into the ministry of the angels in the Old Testament, ministry of the angels in the New Testament. I think it would surprise most of us the hundreds and hundreds of examples and references, I mean, in the Word of God to angels. It, it, you know, if you've never studied it, it would just blow your mind how many times they're mentioned. They're everywhere. Uh, in the Word of God, manifesting to the saints and to the servants of the Lord at the times when God's purpose was unfolding in our generation. And I believe with all my heart, that so many witnesses of it from the Word of God, as well as the, uh, what the Lord has shown so many of the prophetic vessels from coast to coast, other nations, the uh, prominent role, uh, I, I don't mean prominent over the Word of God or the Spirit of Jesus, but a major role that angels are going to have in the end-day church with children and the healing of the sick and the whole ministry of the Holy Spirit. And, I'm just so welcoming that. I said, Lord, you know, send the, the manifestation of the angels. Of course, they're already here anyway, but let us go ahead and see what is already happening because they're involved so often anyway. But uh, that's just exciting that these appearances have happened a number of times. Uh, we could take time on those, but I don't think that you, may, you know, you mentioned before that you don't feel like that. And so it glorifies the Lord and we want to really keep this thing focused that way. Well, I do want to say that uh, those that are having trouble with the angels now, they may get stuck here and stay here. They're going to see one flying through the air preaching the everlasting gospel, and so um, I'd rather believe in them now. And 
<laughs> shock us now, don't shock us then. Okay, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, those, uh, we're uh, kind of winding down here on your ministry as a, as a young man and a boy. Your preparation. Uh, let's talk about the prayer. How, what kind of prayer? The fasting. Uh, just any dimension that you want to give us. You know, we hear those things and sometimes I go, oh no. And I've been surprised to learn some of the things about your life. You know, the, the difference between travail and just the availability. And just explain or give some comments on the way you prepared yourself in those years. Well, Mike, I think one of the most often asked questions was how did you get this gift? What did you do to get it? And how many days did you fast? Or how many angels did you see? Or uh, that sort of thing. And uh, the truth of the matter is there's no set uh, formula for a visitation like that. Sometimes it's a sovereign thing. You don't do anything. I don't remember doing anything. I do know that after the Lord came to me, I did a lot of fasting. In fact, we're talking about fasting the other day. And the longest fast I ever had, I didn't have any uh, sense, didn't know anything about breaking a fast. So I came out of the mountains, uh, the uh, place where I had a Quonset hut and a cabin, in this isolated place. And so I came out of there after this long fast and uh, found a greasy spoon restroom and uh, ate a large bowl of chili, maybe two bowls of chili, and a side order of mashed potatoes. So I thought that was a wonderful combination, you know, and I, that's what I wanted, it's what my appetite called for, and uh, it's a wonder it hadn't killed me. But anyway, he'd been fasting uh, several number, uh, quite a number of weeks, and so go ahead. Yeah, and, and so uh, that's there's no formula for it. Now that's a good formula to have visions, uh, or, or <laughs> you know. But uh, there's no real it's being formula for it. For people who don't yeah, understand, I was just trying to be funny, Mike. But uh, the, the, the part of it is, uh, that thrills me is that. Uh, those men that did fast for 40 days, uh, many of them got power. Uh, they received power. And, um, uh, but a lot of us, uh, there was just a sovereign intervention and it was nothing we did, nothing we did to deserve it. I can't remember one thing I did to deserve uh, the revelation or the visitation. Not one thing, but after it came. You know, there's a scripture where Jesus... After it, the anointing came. After, after the, the anointing came, came, then I began right. to do those things as a labor of love. Now, there's a scripture, Mike, where Jesus said, From henceforth I call you no more servants, but friends, because you know a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. But now that he, that he has that kind of relationship, or I have that kind of relationship with him, I want to be a servant. I want to be a bond slave. I want to be... Uh, you know, we want to we want to do these things. So, uh, but with me, I didn't fast to get anything. I fast because uh, I love the Lord, and uh, you know, He had already done so much for me. I loved Him because He first loved me. So I began to fast. And so the calling and the mantle were freely given to you, but growing in greater communion, uh, there was a place for prayer and fasting in terms of enhancing your communion with the Lord. But you didn't get right. your ministry through that. That was given to you freely as a gift yeah. from the Lord. The I believe the Lord just gave true? me a, uh, yes, that's true. I believe he just gave me a word of wisdom on that. What I did in the way of fasting and prayer and all that was maintenance work. You know, we have to maintain uh, Excellent. Uh, this sort of thing. So it's, that was maintenance work. And, uh, but the uh, Lord calls you in those days, and, and even I know even now, you keep talking about those days because that's the section we're in. I know that he still uh, requires some of those things of you today. That I know that you're hesitant to talk about what you're doing now. But uh, uh, because you know you're living now, but uh, you would spend uh, hours a day. Not of opinion, but thank you. So that's a matter of opinion if you're living now. And uh, but uh, you, the Lord required you to spend hours waiting on Him, and it wasn't always travailing, aggressive prayer. Sometimes there, there, there was that intercession, that crying out, that beseeching and travail for others, for Himself. But Paul said many times he would wait quietly with, with not any, you know, without vocalizing hours at a time of just conscious availability to the Lord with, you know, no TV on, no newspaper, or nothing around in the room, waiting on the Lord consciously, just talking to him. But it wasn't that energetic, you know, on his knees, you know, crying out, you know, in travail in that way. 
And he said that those quiet times, even hours and hours at a time, were, were as valuable as that kind of energetic time. That, that there's, there's a room for both kinds of prayer in the preparation ministry of moving in the Spirit. Right. It's that what, what we do in our spare time uh, tells uh, a big story, you know. And uh, so I would, uh, rather than just say, oh God, oh God, and get desperate in prayer and try veil and, you know, and that sort of intercessory type prayer, uh, there are many desperate situations where that was employed, you know, but for the most part, it was, Lord, I'm here, I'm available, I'm, I'm fasting TV, I didn't care for it then anyway, but it's easy to give us something you don't like, and, uh, you know, and I never liked to play golf, so I could always criticize others that did, but I could easily give up things that I didn't like to do in the first place. But just fasting everything you like to do and uh, giving that up and just being available and sitting uh, quietly in a room or, uh, uh, you know, not engage in conversation with anybody for a whole day and just be with the Lord. And there'll be, there'll be some praying. Uh, there'll be uh, times of uh, uh, other things there, but just being available is important. Yeah, I thought that was really uh, a really powerful point of instruction. Sometimes with the word open, with, with shutting out everything else, but not always that energetic kind of uh, of reaching, but just that consciousness of the Lord, awareness of Him, waiting, Lord, here I am, speak, your servant listens, I'm available, I've shut out all the distractions, and here I am. Uh, I'd like to talk about that time, I've heard you mention it before, we haven't covered all these beforehand, so we got together beforehand and looked at some of these, but some of these are surprise questions. When you were presumptuous. Uh, as a boy, when you saw the other guys, uh, you know, whining and dining and doing things, you said, well, Lord, I want to do it that way. And how the revelation left you. And let's talk yeah. about that for a minute. If well, you we are that. jumping all the way uh, from, I mean, we're jumping all the place now. There are different time frames here. But when I first started out, and this was in Los Angeles, uh, I would stay shut in 24 hours This uh, early 50s. Uh, yeah, well, in 1949, 1950, I would stay in my room uh, around the clock, uh, I would have, uh, if I was fasting, I'd stay there, or I'd have my meals brought in. I'd never leave that room. I'd never go out to eat with pastors. How about the blindfold, too? Oh, okay. And so, uh, anyway, um, I would uh, have someone pick me up, take me to the meeting. I'd lie down in the back seat, put a blindfold on, because I didn't want to see anything to distract. Now, I was really criticized for that because uh, they didn't understand that. But I, I didn't want to see anything to distract. It wasn't a matter that I had a lust problem, because there wasn't that much uh, to see in those days. Uh, people were closed back then. But uh, you didn't want to distract like the visions. The visions yeah, I didn't want to see, see a neon sign. I didn't want to see uh, uh, a car, uh, a new car in a, in a showcase window. I didn't want to see anything. So you'd actually lay down in the car. I'd lie down in the car. Walk in the meeting. Seven. So well, you see me doing that next week, you'll know, but... <laughs> oh my God. Yes. But the thing, uh, the role that played was, while I was shut in uh, for those hours, the Lord would actually allow me to see what uh, was going to happen that night. And there would be stretcher cases, hospital gurneys, and a ambulance stretchers with people on them all across the front of those auditoriums in those days. And when I would, uh, long before I'd get there, I would see what the lady on this stretcher uh, was all about. I'd see what was wrong with her, and I'd just right down the line. So I'd tell my helpers on the way, uh, while I was lying down the back seat, what I'd seen that day. And I said, when, I, when we get there, when we walk in, this is the way it's going to be. There's going to be a, a lady uh, on the first stretcher, and she's going to have a certain thing wrong with her. Then uh, right in sequence. So you see the open vision, or. The angel of the Lord would speak a name or this or that, and so you'd see it all in advance, or not all, but much of right. it. And you'd go in, it'd be just like you saw it earlier that day right, in the prayer closet. And that's when we were moving in tremendous power and unassuming, you know, and uh, just uh, almost direct contact uh, with, with uh, the angel of the Lord. And he would just whisper these things to me. But before the people ever lined up, I would know who they were and what was wrong with them. And it wasn't that I had a brilliant mind, because I didn't. Uh, I don't have recall, I don't have a, a, a good memory except in the Spirit. And those things the Lord revealed in the Spirit up until a, a couple of years ago or so, 
I've never forgotten anything the Lord ever revealed to me and quickened to me in the spirit. I could go back 30 years later and remember everything that happened there. Uh, you know, every name that was revealed to me. But anyway, to make this story as short as possible, one, at one point in Los Angeles, I felt that uh, I would be able to do this without staying shut in all day. Because, because the other guys Yeah, because I met others in the ministry, and uh, there, there was some power ministry in those days. And uh, they even went to movies, they went out to eat, they went sightseeing, and they did all kinds of things uh, uh, during the day, go deep sea fishing and all that. And uh, I never did do these things. And I felt uh, that that was the secret to the power that I, ha that I had with the Lord. Well, anyway, I felt, well, if they can get away with it, uh, I can too. And so I thought, well, I don't need, uh, you know, to be shut in. So I, I started visiting that day and uh, enjoyed telling funny stories and, and uh, just having the time in my life. And I really had more faith that night for the meeting than I'd ever had before because the Lord set me up. I had just as much revelation that night as I ever had, maybe more. So I had all these people lined up and uh, uh, the first lady in the line, I knew her name, I knew I was wrong with her. I, I could go down maybe 75 people just in a flash like that and uh, I would know pretty well uh, what, what was going to come down. Like the lady, the third lady there having trouble with her husband, you know, and, and there's divorce here, and just right down the line, just powerful. And so the very first lady, now let me tell you, just the night before or so, uh, this is the way it came down. The first lady in the line, your name is Mary Moss. You have uh, been dying with cancer for six and a half years. You have six cancers in your body. Mary Moss, go home. The cancers are dying, they're dead tonight, and you'll live. And she went home and passed six cancers this from her body. This was all by revelation. All by revelation. Saw Mary Moss or heard yeah, of it. The lady behind you, you have an octopus type cancer in your stomach. It's coming out by the tentacles, it's coming out by the roots. Uh, go to the restroom and vomit this cancer up. You're healed. She went and vomited the cancer up, and so she and Mary Moss got together and went to the Greasy Spoon hot dog uh, stand, and she had two hot dogs with mustard and onions and everything on it just to test her healing. And Mary Moss went home and passed uh, six cancers. So that sort of thing. You could do 75, 100, sometimes uh, uh, several hundred in a meeting, depending on where well, the intensity of the spirit was. Every one of them wasn't that dramatic, but I mean, uh, uh, there would be knowledge of them, but not, not everyone's that dramatic in the healing, but there would be some kind of uh, revelation to trigger off some faith. But anyway, I, it, was, it was greater that next night, and that was the day that I spent uh, haphazardly visiting and all that, and presumptuously uh, thinking I'd get away with it. And so I was really smart like that night. I stood up there and I looked at that lady and I said, Lady, you're really in for it. I said, I see everything in your life. I can tell you everything about yourself. In fact, there's about 75 people I've already tuned in on. I can tell everyone of you what's wrong with you. And so I looked at this lady and I said, lady, your name is, and I went blank. I mean, I, it just seemed like uh, everything I had ever had in the way of revelation, just uh, like you poured a can of paint thinner out on me and just uh, uh, took it all out. And I said, uh, whoa, just a minute, I mean, lady, uh, I looked down and all those people were, t uh, you know, nothing. I mean, there was absolutely nothing. I said, lady, I'm very sorry, but uh, the anointing is gone and, uh, and I'm gone. And I said, if it comes back tomorrow night, folks, I'll be back. If it doesn't, you'll never see me again. And so I, I went home and cried all night that night and asked the Lord to give me another chance. And, and he did. Wow, that's quite a story. Uh, that's uh, a real lesson on presumption. John chapter 5, verse 19. Uh, Jesus said, that The Father shows me all things that he himself is doing. And I only do the things that my Father's doing. And uh, I've come to understand through Paul's ministry ministry through uh, William Branham's that uh, uh, Bob Jones moved this way a lot that uh, uh, that what the Jesus was talking about in John 5 19 is that the Lord would show uh, the father would show the son ahead of time he would see what he was doing that he only did what the father was doing and I've been in uh, uh, 
I witnessed it many times in the meetings all the different places the last couple of years where he would see the things ahead of time and still functions in that way and uh, when the creative miracles uh, we're going to give some of those examples in some of those places where the creative miracles were taking place and and uh, Paul would go to the platform and say there's going to be happen this and this and this will happen tonight if and they'd be sitting just where he said and the names and boom it would happen just like the, he had in the vision earlier that, that day or the night before sometimes you get the visions months in advance and you wouldn't know what city you'd go to a city and there they are right there the setting is just set just like the move just, just like the uh, i was gonna say the movie screen vision but the vision uh weeks and months earlier so that was really something let's uh just we got a few minutes here let's uh, talk about the silent years for a few moments uh you know the near uh 25 years of near silence is how i've heard you uh, call it uh why why did god call you in this 25 years i mean i know for a fact some people have asked it. It wasn't due to sin. I know that. It wasn't disqualification. There was nothing that you did uh, uh, to where the Lord was setting you down to discipline you in a negative way. But uh, I know he made it clear to you then and now that it was a thing to do greater dealings in your life to bring you to greater sensitivity, etc. But just talk about that. And what was the revelation the Lord gave you? Was there one revelation that pulled you apart? Was there a series of them? And, and why do you think the, over, uh, the overall reason for God to... So it sets you apart like that for 25 years. Well, my, it, it could be that uh, I misunderstood this, but I don't know for sure that I was ever called to uh, play a greater role in the in the healing movement. I think I fell into that. In the 50s, of, we're talking about the, the movement in the 50s. That right. was not your major calling in life. That was not the ultimate. That was not what God called me to do. And, and uh, later on in life, that's when the Lord gave my mother this warning, you know, that you've not yet done what I called you to do. And uh, the, the healing movement was not what God called me to do. I was just kind of a natural, supernatural, uh, uh, not even a misfit, I just fell right into that. And uh, that wasn't what uh, the Lord called me to. Once he spoke to me and said, you know, you, I didn't call you to be um, uh, wealthy and famous, I called you to be obedient. Now the Lord actually, and comes and gives you this experience where he tells you this i did not call you to be rich and famous uh, or uh, to be wealthy and famous but he did uh, say something that no one believes he said to me but he did say it just the way he said it and uh, so i don't uh, uh, i don't have any problem repeating it the way he said it. he said you are in a rat race and even if you win you'll still be a rat so, uh, and he was talking about the competitiveness. These ministries were so competitive. I mean, they were, my tent's bigger than yours. You know, my tumor that I got out of that lady is bigger than the tumor you got out of that lady. And, and uh, the Lord called that a rat race. And he said that if you, even if you've got the biggest and the best, you're still a rat in this arena if you stay in it. Yeah, but by this time, see, there was rivalry and competition and uh, everybody was trying to get uh, ahead and... Uh, uh, there were managers in those days, uh, carnal men that would come along, and they, their intent was to uh, make you as famous or more famous than Jesus if they could, because there'd be more money in it, and uh, for them and, and everyone concerned. So the Lord was angry, and he was dealing out divine sarcasm when he said, I didn't call you to be wealthy and famous, I called you to be obedient, you're in a rat race, and even if uh, you win, you'd still be a rat, you know. So he, uh, he specifically, go ahead. It was a rebuke, and uh, it was on the heels of that disillusionment and that uh, type of uh, response from the Lord. Uh, my response was the almost silent years. So uh, any failures, depression, boredom in that 25 years? I mean, what's going on in you? Uh, like, what? do you ever give up hope of your ministry? You give us some... And so, I never lost hope, Mike, but there would be the hotshot promoters that would come around, and I remember one in particular, incidentally, met with a horrible death after this, but he stood right before me, or sat before me in a restaurant, and he said, if you will come down off of that cross and uh, let me promote you, you're not uh, too old to what uh, uh, I can make you the, a household name, I can make you the most famous evangelist, and so on. Well, that sort of thing. And uh, it re repelled me, you know. And, I, and the cross meaning it was a religious trip you were on, uh, drawing out of that big arena, the big tent. You got rid of the tent, the advertisement, the promotion. And when yeah. you refused to do that, the guy was accusing you of some religious... Yeah, having a religious spirit or, you know, uh, 
the martyr spirit and that sort of thing. And so, uh, was, was there any failures in your life at that time or anything that you regret before the Lord that you didn't do the way that you wish you would have done? Well, there was a temptation to, uh, to live better, you know, to be more comfortable because uh, many times I was in maybe a little, uh, most of the time I was in a little two-bedroom house. I slept on the couch in the living room and... Uh, uh, about the, the nearly the 25 years. Yeah, we're talking about the bigger part of that. It was, it was spent in uh, uh, sacrificial living and um, so I don't know how I made it, Mike. Well, I really the, don't. The support, it was, how did the support come? Well, it was, it was like the Lord uh, had promised to be my invisible means of support and he surely was. I mean, he became my invisible means of support. I've tried to figure it out. There's no way. Because for 25 could, years, you were not going out except for, I think you went out four or five times a year as a rule, something like that. And right. uh, so you didn't have honorariums coming in, you didn't have, and yet you were waiting on the Lord these years. And, and so how did you get the money with only four or five, six meetings a year? It was uh, the Lord becoming the invisible means of support. Now, I'll give you one incident. We won't, we won't go too far with this. But once he told me to go to uh, the post office and ask for a letter at general delivery, it took a lot of faith to do that because I was in a city where no one knew me. It was a small town. And I went to the, uh, uh, the post office by revelation and went through a, 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 quite a, a thing there because I just felt foolish. I really felt foolish, but I thought I knew the voice of the Lord. So I went over to uh, the window and asked uh, the general, general delivery clerk if, if I had any mail. And he said, oh, I wondered uh, who you'd be. He said, I've had a letter here for you for several days. So he handed me a letter and uh, there, uh, there was five $100 bills in the letter, see. And so uh, it was from a dear mother in Israel, and a widow of a well-known uh, Assemblies of God uh, pastor. And uh, Mother Green had had a vision that uh, I needed help and that I would, the Lord would show me to stop at that post office. And uh, she said, I don't know how you're going to get it, but I'm just obeying the Lord. But I got it. And so that was part of the invisible means of support. And it was just marvelous, Mike. 